Hey everyone, it's Tony Robbins here. Welcome to the second season of our podcast. In fact, if you're back after last year, welcome back. Welcome home. And if you're not, let me tell you what this podcast is about. I'm obsessed. I hope you are too. I'm obsessed with wanting to find the answers to what makes the difference in the quality of people's lives. I've always been fascinated to see people that have been given everything. You know, tremendous love in their family, tremendous education, economic advantage. They're looked out for in every way. And oftentimes the people you give the most to are become emotionally or psychologically weak, not strong. Often they find themselves fighting their way in and out of rehab, even though they had every kind of love and support you can imagine. And then you see the opposite, don't you? You see people out there that life has just stomped all over, who've been abused mentally, emotionally, physically, sexually, anything you can imagine, and yet... Rather than live in the story, which they had every right to do, something inside of them won't settle. Something inside of them is so hungry, becomes so driven, because the pain, the disappointment, the frustration doesn't stop them, it drives them. And they create the most extraordinary lives, not only for themselves, but they become an inspiration to all of us as well. I'm also equally passionate about business, and a lot of this you know, 70, 75% of the people that come to my live events are business owners because I think people who are want to live life on their terms are attracted to what I do because they're looking for what are those edges. And where I found those edges to help people grow their business 30 to 130% or more, what's gotten me to be able to coach multi-billionaire clients like the Mark Benioffs of the world from Salesforce.com or Peter Guber who owns the, the Golden State Warriors basketball team, the LA Dodgers, you know, he's got 52 Academy Award nominations, Paul Tudor Jones, one of the top 10 financial traders in the world. The reason I've got to coach them is because I have found answers from the very best on earth. I didn't make them up. And so the purpose of this podcast is to bring you the greatest minds that I know of in the world, the people I consider to be mentors and friends who have insights that can truly change the quality of your life and your business. Now, this podcast, even though I'm passionate about it, almost never came to be because I got a challenge, probably the same one you do, time. It's like when my team came and said, you know, we'd love to have you do a podcast. I was like, guys, are you kidding me? I mean, I, I'm running around like a crazy person. Every, approximately every four days, I'm either on stage or on a plane or a train and a helicopter in direction towards one. You know, I go to 12 to 15 countries a year. I see about 200,000 people last year to give you an idea. And, you know, I also have 18 companies, 12 that I actively manage. And of those 12, we have more than 1,000 employees on three continents and six different industries, I think seven now, actually. And, you know, and we do over $5 billion in sales. And I start out with no business background and no even desire to do it. But I did have an obsession with wanting to find a way to do more for other people than anyone else is doing, to find a way to add more value. So I want to bring you those people, and of course I want to do the podcast, but it's like, where do I do this in my spare time? And so I first told my team no. But then, you know, people kept talking to me about a program I used to do called Power Talk. And I did it for about half a decade, where at that stage of my life, I interviewed all these brilliant people, and it's still a favorite product for many people. And I thought, well, I could do this. I could bring the greatest minds to you if I could get some leverage. And so last year, the way we did it is we created our co-host who did the actual physical interviews. I set it up and gave people the frames and the follow-up. And that was Anna, and she did an amazing job. I'm very grateful to her. But this year, I'm going to do some of the interviews as well, and I want to mix it up. And I thought, who better to do this than my own personal right arm? Uh, the woman who, who I pitch and catch with every day, woman who's one of my best friends on the face of the earth, and for Bonnie Pearl, her best friend on the face of the earth, and somebody who literally knows what I know. She's the person, along with Diane Adcock, who runs my creative department, Mary Buckeye is her name, or Mary B, as she's affectionately known, you know, all the different partners and, and uh, employees and associates we have all over the world. Mary is the person that we're constantly brainstorming together to figure out how are we going to take this message and tighten it? How are we going to strengthen it? How are we going to get through to people here in China, different than people in Australia? And so we literally have times we travel the world together with our mission, and we have times that it's 24-7, those nights, those all-nighters as well. So I thought she would be the perfect person to do this because there's also not somebody who knows me better, knows my thoughts, can help me extend this and get this information to you, but also not anybody on the face of the earth that I respect or love more as well. So with that ado, let me introduce to you. Oh, and I should give you a background for one second that I'll introduce you to Mary. And that is, you know, she was a, a Division I extraordinary athlete, captain of her team in soccer and tremendous softball player. And then she left that to go to work with ESPN and, and literally 
she launched so quickly, they gave her some of the most important interviews. One of the first interviews she did was with a, a young man just coming to the NBA called LeBron James. So she could, they gave her some really interesting and challenging pieces. And then after eight years there, she left to go work with a gentleman who's one of the world's great adventurers, who literally explores the earth everywhere. And she got to explore all the corners of the earth with just a brilliant man. She has a great and varied background, but her heart, her soul, her commitment, and her mind, her brilliance, I want her to be our co-host here. So here she is, without further ado, Mary B, Mary Buckeye. All those compliments, Tone. And really, I'm just like human Velcro to you. That's my <laughs> yes. biggest That's my biggest achievement, is living this life in your shorts pocket, traveling everywhere with you and Bonnie Pearl. Yes, you are my Velcro friend, and you're reading my mind, so I'm very, very grateful. So let's talk with our team here in this first podcast, and we're going to do a part of this together, and then I'm going to leave it to you. But let's start with, uh, let's talk about who this is, and why are we bringing this person out for our, our interview for the first part of the second season? I am delighted to tell you why, Tone, because... This is a human being who is a graduate from Brown University and not a standout athlete in one sport, but in three. And again, at Brown, which is not exactly a safety school over there in Providence. So graduated with a degree in psychology. We love to talk to her about picking the brains of, of other human beings. She herself then went on to become the number one triathlete in the entire world, even though at age 23, she says she still could basically only swim to save her life. Never had any technique, coaching, training, never got in the water, never got in a pool. And then she comes on to be the world number one. How do you do that, Tony Robbins? You're going to love this because that's what we asked her. We dug into her psychology here and you're going to fall in love with this lady because, listen, you're a business owner, many of you. You're an athlete yourself or maybe were at one time and maybe didn't take all that you had from athletics to the next part of your life. And I found that athletics is really about peak performance. I wanted to do this interview with her because the Olympics starts this Friday. And I think it's an opportunity to think about this. These are the greatest athletes in the world. These are people that had a vision larger than anybody else, but they didn't just talk about it. They didn't get enthusiastic about it. They figured out how to convert that absolute vision into reality where they competed with everyone on earth. And now they're coming to this final competition there's very little that could be more inspiring, but to hear this woman who couldn't even swim, barely keep her head above water, deciding, just making that decision, just like starting a business, just like saying, I'm gonna take my company public, or I'm gonna make a million dollars or 10 million or a billion. You know, there was no reason that she should be able to feel certain she could do this, but she made the decision within herself, and then she went on the journey, and this interview, I think you're gonna be very touched by. It's, it's one that I don't care if you're a business owner or if you're an employee for someone else, or you're a mom or a dad, or you're an aspiring athlete, or you just wanna to go to another level. It's a reminder that any of us can go from the worst to the best if we're willing to pay the price. And if we understand the fundamentals of how to coach ourselves and get quality coaching to get from where we are to where we wanna be. And by the way, if you are a business owner, you're also going to be driven by this podcast because we're going to dig into her psychology, not how she went from doing what seemed impossible to making it real, turning her vision into reality, but also she's now the world's greatest coach. I mean, if you want to become a triathlete and you have the money, the time, the energy, and the true commitment, the first thing you want to do is make a journey to Boulder, Colorado. To see, to Boulder. <laughs> that's right, to see if you can get Siri to take you on. So I'm going to ask her, how do you build a championship team, an Olympic championship team? How do you recruit people? How do you know if they're the right ones? How do you know when to let go of them? All the things you have to do in your business or maybe even in your personal life as well at times. And how do you build sustainable success in anything? You, you were telling me a quote about her. What were you saying? I was saying that I think that what the essence of Siri Lindley really is, is I was listening to an interview watching that she did on TV and she said she basically went from being crappy to being, in her words, on the top basically, which is, as we know, the number one world ranking, so. If you want to go from being crappy to being number one in the world, you better listen. Take a few notes here. <laughs> Here's the pathway. So without further ado, meet Siri, Siri Lindley. Lindley. Hello? Siri? Oh my God. We Tony. have contact. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for I the logistical. Believe... <laughs> oh my God. No problem. I am just, Tony, I have to say, I, this is like a dream come true just hearing your voice on the other side of the phone. I seriously don't, I can't understand if this is a dream or not because you're highly responsible for like a lot of anything at all that I've done. Well, you gotta so be, you. That's, you, well, that's compliment because I've been so excited to talk to you because your history is so unique. And you know, my whole life is about finding people that just make decisions and then make the impossible happen. And you've done that in your life multiple times. So it's really a privilege to have you on the podcast, and I really appreciate uh, you taking the time. 
Oh my God, it's such a great honor. So really, thank you so much. I mean, a lot of what I learned from you helped me to have the courage to make those decisions that I had to make. So really, thank you very, well, very much. Well, you're very kind. You give me more credit than I deserve as all your hard work. But no. let's, let's, <laughs> let's jump into it right away here. I've kind of done an introduction in advance of you here to kind of save you some time. But let me just repeat it for those who might just be joining. You know, you are a human being that has done things most human beings would think would be impossible. You're, you know, you go to Brown, you're a three sport athlete. I, give me the genesis of this decision. Cause, you know, a lot of our listeners are business owners and they're, you know, they've got to make decisions where they can take what seems to be impossible and make it possible. It's the same metaphor. They've got to build teams, they've got to recruit people, they got to know who are the right people, they got to figure out how to inspire them and motivate them to follow through, they got to build a culture. You've done all that at the level called Olympics, you know, at the level where the very best on the earth is not, and you've done it competing against people. So I'd love to start, if we could, with a little bit of your journey. Yeah, I heard, and as I understand it, that at one stage, even though you had not, you're not a swimmer, you decided you're going to become number one in the world as a triathlete. Tell, tell me how this comes about and tell me the role that maybe um, coaching played along the way, because I know you had a pretty extraordinary coach. Yeah. Um, well, in the beginning, so I had been a three-sport athlete, field hockey, ice hockey, and lacrosse at Brown University, and I loved it, and, and that was amazing. Um, but there was something inside of me, I think, that I've always kind of doubted myself, and I've always been afraid and a little bit insecure. And I think part of my journey was that I needed to do something that was going to show me what I was capable of on my own, without a team around me, you know, like as a team, you win a game and you know that you are a part of it, but you don't really know how much of yeah. an input you had towards that win. And so when I learned about triathlon, I had a friend that was doing a triathlon and she asked me to come watch and I had no clue what it was. And I showed up and I saw all these people of different ages and different sizes and different abilities. And I just thought it looked like the most incredible challenge. Um, these people pushing them to the limits just to find out what they were capable of. Um, so I started training for it, but I, I didn't know how to swim. The only swim I'd ever really done was swanning with my mom, which is like keeping your head out of the water because she has this beautiful blonde hair and she didn't want to get it wet. And so she'd just like do breaststroke with her head out of the water. <laughs> so <laughs> when I got in the pool the first time and I had told my friend, look, I really want to do triathlon. Um, she took one look at me and thought, oh God, this is going to be a big project. <laughs> um, you know, I didn't really tell anyone, um, how far I wanted to go or what I was dreaming of. But as, as time went by and I had been training for a few months and I was complete disaster basically in all three, I just knew, you know, in my heart and in my gut that I had to do this and I had to take this as far as I could possibly go. And I told my mom that, uh, I wanted to be the best in the world. Um, which is crazy. She kind of laughed at me because she had seen me practicing. Um, <laughs> she, you know, so, uh, when well, your mom doesn't first... believe in you, it's not very promising. <laughs> you know? Exactly. So that was a little scary for me, but I thought, no, I'm still going to do it. And I flew out to Colorado. I'd been living in Massachusetts at the time, and I flew all the way out to Colorado because I wanted to do a race where no one knew me. And I did this race, and um, the first thing, you know, they line you up, and you have to kind of uh, put yourself in the group of your same ability. But I had no idea about what swim times were or what 100 meters was. And so they asked me, you know, what lane are you in? And I said, I, oh, I don't know. I don't know. And I was getting all nervous. And all these people were lining up behind me. And they said, you've got to tell me, are you a 120 per 100, 130 per 100, 140? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Just 120. And I put, got myself in this lane because I didn't understand what that meant. And, it, and <laughs> Oh my God, it was like all these amazing swimmers with these like triangular backs and they looked so fit. But I was such a dork at the time and I still am that I was so eager to have my best race that I just stood right up at the front of all these, you know, gods with these triangular backs and started the race in front of them and got absolutely pummeled on the swim. And it was just like, it was the scariest thing, but it was awesome because after about half 
it, this swim was done in a pool. And so I was just getting pummeled every time they went by me. But the great thing was that when I was only halfway through my swim, they were all done. So I, I actually had the whole thing to myself. I was just so excited. My mom standing on the side of the pool with my spandex pants, which, again, terrible mistake. I'm trying to get in my spandex pants, and I'm all wet. So I get on my bike, and I'm hammering away on this, you know, heavy 100-pound bike, but loving it. And, you know, but people are looking at me funny because I'm grunting and groaning and obviously don't know what I'm doing. And I get off on the run, and this was, I was thinking, okay, you know, I'm, I'm used to this. I run up and down a field in field hockey and lacrosse. I'm just going to do what I do out there. And I was just doing these flat-out 100-meter sprints as hard as I could go to the point that <laughs> gagging and I'm huffing and puffing. And I, I covered the whole 5K like that, just these 100-meter sprints followed by a gag and a, you know, <laughs> Didn't notice the thing, you know, I crossed the line. I was just so thrilled. And my mom was there. She had packed up everything in the car and she's like, okay, let's go. And I said, wait a second, the awards are at one o'clock. Like, we can't leave now. And she looked at me like, oh my God. My daughter was like, <laughs> you know, of course I didn't get an award. I was literally, I mean, probably last place. And I got home that night. Well, actually, that day I was just on cloud nine. It was like the greatest challenge of my life. And I'd just been totally inside myself the whole entire race. But that night I got in bed and I closed my eyes and suddenly all the disgusted looks on the people's faces, like watching me like, oh, my God, why is that girl even trying to do this? Like, look at her. That's so embarrassing. And oh, my God, she's got a spandex pant halfway down her leg and the other one up by her. <laughs> you know, and all the faces that I didn't really pay attention to during the race, but suddenly they were all flooding back into my mind and I just broke down in tears. I was so upset and I went into my mom's bedroom and I woke her up and I'm bawling and she said, I know, honey, it's okay. Like there's so many things that you're good at. Don't worry about it. I have never wanted anything so bad in my life. Wow. And it was in that moment that I just, you know, in, in stating it to her, I already knew in my heart um, but there was just something about being so terrible at something and all my insecurity, you know, I, I was able to put it away during the race, but it all kind of came back with the looks on people's faces and that memory. And that actually really, really motivated me to just want to become, first of all, just proficient in this sport that I so desperately wanted to be good at. Well, you just hit on, you know, when people ask me, what is the single most important ingredient of uh, the most successful people I've ever met in the world. And, you know, everybody wants to know, like, what's the one thing? And, of course, life, it's never just one thing. But if you had to pick one, I don't care if it's, you know, Sir Richard Branson or Serena Williams or Hugh Jackman or anybody who's the best in the world at what they do, it's hunger. And you just described that again. I always share with people, you know, intelligence is so incredibly valuable. You know, physical strength and skill is so valuable. But there are a lot of intelligent people who can't fight their way out of a paper bag. It's that hunger <laughs> that makes you just go far beyond anything you can imagine. Where does that hunger come from in you, do you think? I think it comes from, um, you know, for whatever reasons in, in my early life, um, lacking the confidence, feeling like I wasn't really important enough and, and almost feeling like I didn't belong in, in this world because I, I wasn't good enough or there was no reason for me being there. I mean, it's kind of um, obviously as kids, the things we go through and how we perceive the things that we go through really affect our, our perception of ourselves. And um, But so I many people, so... can I interject for you that series? So many people oh, yeah, will please. look at that and they'll they'll be destroyed by it. It's like disappointment either destroys you or drives you, right? You know, and for most people, it just, they let it destroy them. You know, what is it in you that in spite of all that pain, and I understand the pain that helped to drive you, but why did you convert into drive as opposed to giving up, which is what most people do? I think I was just so desperate to feel good and, and to feel safe in my own body and to feel like I belonged. And mm. I was just desperate to... Um, to be happy. I, I wanted something different than the way that I felt. I was so uncomfortable in my own skin and so uncomfortable in, in the world that I was in. And I didn't want to live that way anymore. Like, like I knew that there was an, a better way. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, you know, you watch people, um, 
you know, like I, I have a sister who, who I love so much, but we went through the same stuff growing up, but we made different choices. You and, you know, and yeah. sometimes I, I feel guilty in a way that, you know, I, I've been so blessed in my life, but I do feel that it is a choice. You have to make that decision. I don't want to feel bad anymore, you know, and yeah, so that's where the hunger came from. And it was more just, I mean, first and foremost, wanting to just appreciate and like myself, hmm. um, you yeah, know, so, and, and yeah. feeling safe because I didn't really feel safe, you know, in my life anywhere else. And I at least wanted to feel safe in my own skin. Wow. I think, you know, for, for women, especially most men have no clue. I ask men very often in seminars, how many of you have been worried for your safety at one point in the last six months. And usually I get three hands, you know, maybe five hands in a room of 8,000, 10,000 people. I ask women, how many of you have had a concern for your safety in the last six months? 99% of the room raises their hand. And so it's interesting that you converted this. So what you felt this sense of, is it the strength that gave you the safety? It was the sense of mastery? I'm just curious. I think, you know, I don't know that I, I went into the sport saying, this is what I'm going to get out of it. Got it. Um, I know that I, at the time, my whole, I was living my life out of a place of fear all the time. And I think the, trans, the biggest transformation in me throughout the whole process of doing the sport was that I started really loving what I was doing because I was, I was gaining confidence and, yes. and I was, you know, doing something that was making me feel good about myself. And so then I started focusing on living my life from a place of love, if that makes sense. Oh, that's and beautiful. saying, I'm going to be afraid, you know, I still get afraid, but I would rather just take steps towards you know, doing the things that I love and trying hard and being productive and being proactive and focusing on the things that I love and having that be the major theme in my life and keeping the fear at bay, you know? Uh, you're, you're saying the fundamentals that are true to be a champion in a sport, but also be a champion in business, to be a champion in your own life. I mean, facing fear and then finding a way to find your passion or what you love so it grows. But you didn't love it to start with. You just had the drive to start with. Tell me if you would... You know, I know you had a very special coach. Tell me the role the coach played. And, and you know, did you ever think this is going to be impossible? I mean, you, you made this decisive decision. But tell me a little bit about what, what the road was like, the training road for this. Because most people, I think, overestimate what they're going to do in a year. And they underestimate what they can do in a half a decade or, or a decade or a couple decades in life <laughs> and in business. So, you know, you got to put the time in, but tell me, wh wh how did you find your coach? How important was your coach? And where was your head at? And, and what role did the coach play? Because today, I, you're one of the best coaches in the world. For those that don't know it, okay. if you want to become a triathlete and you have any intelligence and you ask around, you're going to find a bolder man or woman to be trained here if you can. And you can hear by, you know, Siri's mindset and attitude how much people love her. She's beloved in the community besides being respected. Yeah, it's, some people are respected but not loved. You're respected and loved. And it's so obvious why getting oh, a chance wow. to talk with you right now. But tell me a little bit about your coach. Yeah, Siri, I'm going to pop oh. in here. It's Mary B. And I, I listened to, we, Tony and I listened to a previous interview last night with you. And I was touched when you, when you told someone else, you know, you went from, quote, being crappy to, quote, on top, basically, which you're, that's a, another little glimpse into your humility. On top, basically, you didn't say it, but you were world number one two years in a row. <laughs> yes. Being crappy, you're um, world number one. What did Brett Sutton have to do with that? Um, well, okay. First of all, thank you so much. That's like the greatest compliment of my life, and I'm going to save that forever. Oh, um, so, so thank sweet. you. Um, and, and I'm just so lucky that I just really love what I do, and it's such a privilege to, to be able to work with these amazing athletes. Um, I think I want to mention, if you guys don't mind, my first coach um, was a huge part in kind of laying the groundwork, and then I'm going to get to Brett because, yeah, he was just perfect. amazing and, and perfect for me. Um, but my first coach, Yoli Cassis, this is when I, I decided I'm moving out to Colorado. It's the triathlon mecca. I was no good at this point in time, but I, I'm going to take every step to make this happen. And I moved out here. And what I loved about Yoli, she was so passionate about the sport. And her take on me was, I want to train you uh, first of all, knowing that you as a human being are far more important to me than you as an athlete. And she always wow. kind of, like you know, stressed the fact that like who you are as a human being 
is way more important than anything else. And I really love that because I, I really believe, you know, I think some athletes, there's kind of like a fear of success because they don't feel like they deserve, you know, to do well or, or there's something that limits them in that area. And I really feel that her influence on me in wanting to really focus on being the best person I could be, first of all, and then being the best athlete I could be was a really great way to you know, give you that comfort that, you know what, I, I've, I've been the best person I'm capable of being. I've, I've worked my butt off and, and I deserve to do well, to have that, that faith that you really believe that you deserve to do well. So she, she was just amazing. And when I went to train with Brett, he, oh, wow. I mean, he is a, he's a special, special person in that he is just brilliant in getting into the mind of the athlete and I had I'd been doing pretty well I had a a New Zealand coach Jack Ralston that I'd been working with for a couple of years and I was trying to make the Olympic team in 2000 everything was going great I was coming in fourth place in pretty much every world cup race that that I was doing and that was awesome and all and it put me in a great position to qualify for the Olympic team but it wasn't quite enough. So of course, in my heart and and in my mind, I'm thinking I'm just not good enough to take that step onto the podium. Um, And so I started, well, actually, I should tell you that the Olympic trials came along and I was the second ranked American and everybody thought it was going to be a a sure thing that I made the Olympic team. And I had moved to Australia and lived like a monk for six months all by myself in an apartment I was on this kick that I thought you know I'm going to be my strongest if I know that I've done all of this on my own there's no support you're one team. of us <laughs> you're one of us <laughs> you know, we were all like, holed oh, up for six I'm... months before <laughs> it was so awful I had my altitude 10 I was like watching neighbors I don't know if you did this, this horrible oh actually I shouldn't say that this great show in Australia that was like <laughs> yeah, you better watch <laughs> yourself there <laughs> You just lost a country of fans. <laughs> and I love Australia. But no, it was a show that entertained me every night. And I'd eat my dinner. I'd get in my altitude tent. And I would visualize the perfect race. Every single night, my goal was for 365 days, I was going to visualize the perfect race wow. on the exact course that the Olympic trials were going to be on. And the problem with that, I mean, there's a lot of problems with this whole scenario. Um, number one, I'm someone who thrives on love and I thrive on my family and my pets and all of that. And I, I don't know why I felt that that all had to be put aside for me to prove how strong I was on my own. Um, but I did that and, and I felt like I needed to do that at the time. But when I got into the Olympic trials race, um, the gun went off. I dove into the water and within 200 meters, somebody had swum right over the top of me and dunked me under the water. And I lost touch with that group, the front swim group. Oh. And in my visualization for 365 days prior, this never happened. I literally choked. I mean, I was swimming as hard as I could and not even moving. I was came out of the water near last. I got on the bike, which at the time I was feeling the strongest I'd ever been on the bike. I was just being, just dropping further and further back. So as hard as I was going, I was going nowhere. And this was a really pivotal moment for me because, you know, after the race, everyone's like, what happened? Are you sick? Did you have a flat tire? And I, I knew in this moment, it was so important for me to be accountable to me and to acknowledge what really happened. And that was that I choked. I had made this race, the be all end all for me. It was everything I ever dreamed of. I, it just, I, you know, was just purely focused on me and making the team and it was too much. And, you know, it just got the best of me and I froze and, and that was my Olympics. You know, I, I didn't qualify. Well, I qualified as an alternate, um, but I wanted so much more than that. Um, But I think in acknowledging what happened, that really allowed me to move forward. Um, If I had tried to fool myself and make up an excuse as to why things went wrong, I think I just would have, uh, I I wouldn't have gotten any better. Um, So 
I acknowledged that I choked. And at that point, um, another one of the athletes that I used to race against, uh, Loretta Harrop, who's Australian and watches Neighbors, um, <laughs> she <laughs> felt really bad for me. I think she knew how badly I wanted it. And she wrote me a letter and said, look, if you come and train with my squad and my coach, I know he can turn things around for you and help you achieve what you deserve to achieve. And so I wrote him right away. I thought, wow, this is an incredible, you know, honor to be invited. And I wrote him and all I got back was, I'm, uh, you need to get here in one week to Switzerland. I'm the boss. I'm going to think for you. And, you know, I, I don't know, I, I should have it in front of me to read it. It was very powerful. It was very scary. And so I flew home to the United States and literally, you know, packed my bags and moved out to Switzerland uh, to train with Brett Sutton. And here's the incredible, like, like I'd been training, I thought I had been training hard, but I, it was nothing like when I got there. And I think what he wanted to do with me, and maybe I'll explain if you guys are, are willing to listen to like my first couple of days, yes. if I make. Yeah, please. Because what you're describing I... is, is this idea that so many people have the delusion of it. You know, I always say the difference between a wantrepreneur, you know, wantrepreneur versus an entrepreneur is they all think their ideas are what matter. They think that if I just visualize, that's enough. And you and I both know visualization is an important part of training. But that's not enough. I mean, if this visualization didn't come close, if you don't back up your affirmation with discipline, you're deluding yourself. And it sounds like this entered you into a whole other realm. And every business person I know usually gets into business with the purest heart, with a clear visualization, with a great dream to help and save the world or you know bring a product or service there and make a difference. But those ideas are not enough. Ideas are, you know, a dime a dozen. It's the people that can execute, right? The people that can get themselves to do the things no one else does. And that's what you had to do. So when you started training with him, did it look, what was your mindset? I think I saw a video or an interview, one of them with you a week ago, where you were describing it, that what he was wanting to do the impossible. Am I, is my memory right about that? Uh, oh, like every single day. I mean, the first day, my none of my bags arrived, only my bike. And so we, I'd been on the plane for 10 hours. We had a two-hour drive. I arrived and he said, put your bike together. You're doing a wind trainer session downstairs with Loretta Harrop. And I said, oh, well, Brett, I don't have any clothes. Like, I literally just have the clothes that I traveled in. And he said, well, you have your bike, so there's nothing stopping you. Get your bike set up and go downstairs. I'll see you there in 30 minutes. And so I had to go down in my travel clothes and my, you know, my Converse shoes <laughs> and got on my bike and had to do this two-hour, like, horrendous bike session. And the horrible thing was, you know, I got down there and I'm like, oh, cool, Loretta's here. I can feel like a little safe because my friend's here. And I walked into that room. She didn't even look up at me. She had her head down. She's hammering away on the turbo, doesn't even say hello, doesn't like laugh at the fact that I'm in my travel clothes riding my bike. She just ignored me because she was in the middle of the session. And I'm sure. like, oh, my God, I'm so Taking scared. every ounce of herself just to get through it probably, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And, and I guess, you know, that's what I learned. That's how we do things. You know, you it's laser focused you do the session, you get it done. So I did that session. And then it was time to go to bed. I mean, this, this was pretty late in the afternoon. So I woke up the next morning and the plan was we're going to ride 25 kilometers down the mountain to the 50 meter pool. And I thought, oh, cool, great. You know, I can see if my bike's going, what, if my bike's working. We drive down to the pool and I had been used to swimming maybe 3,000 meters a day swimming. And I thought I was doing a great job. Well, we did six and a half K, so 6,500 meters that wow. day. It was all hard. Everyone was faster than me. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to die. But I was like, okay, I can have a nice breakfast after this. We're going to drive home and I can relax. And so we get out of the pool. I shower. I get changed. I come out and I turn to Loretta and I'm like, where's, where's Brett and where's the van? And she said, oh, no, we, we ride home. You know, this is our bikes, our transportation. We ride home. And I'm like, oh, my God up that mountain and she said yeah don't worry about it go with Jane she's she sucks go with Jane so I'm like oh god like this is just crazy but I'm like thank god I can go with Jane and Jane apparently sucks um which is a terrible thing to say I must say she's a little bit harsh but um so we start riding up the hill and Jane proceeds to kick my butt I mean she drops me within five minutes and I'm like oh my god I can't even keep up with Jane who supposedly isn't very strong so we ride 25K back, and that took, you know, 
about an hour and a half because it was just up this huge mountain. I get home, I get in the bath, I eat a big lunch and there's a knock on the door and it's bread again. And I'm like, oh my God, like I'm going to die if he asked me to do anything else. And he said, it's time to run. So come on upstairs. I'll meet you in 10 minutes. We're leaving then. So I go upstairs. I've got my big water bottle. I put it on top of the car and I'd forgotten something down in my apartment. So I ran downstairs and came back up and my water bottle was, it had like one sip left in it. And I was like, guys, you know, who, who drank my water? And Brett said, you don't need that. You should have drank enough in between sessions. You're not allowed to have water during sessions. So I'm like, okay, oh God. So we get back in the van. We go back down to the bottom of the hill, 25 kilometers. And he says, okay, everybody out, lets us out of the car. And he said, I'll see you back at home. And we had to run up that mountain, 25 kilometers on the same day when I had done more than I have probably ever done in one single day. So I got home that night, eventually, <laughs> hours later. And um, now when I look back, I think, oh, I must have felt so exhilarated. But I was like terrified. I'm like, this is my first day. There's no like getting over the travel. Like he's just giving it to me. And I called home to my mom and, you know, she answered the phone and all she could hear on my side was, <gasps> <gasps> and I was just crying on the other side of the phone. And she said, listen, if you can't hack it, come home, but just do your best and see how it goes. Well, so that day, um, we basically every day after that was nearly exactly the same kind of a challenge that seemed so impossible and scared me to death where I'd be shaking before the session. But each day I was able to finish it and I was able to accomplish whatever task he laid in front of me. And what was so brilliant about that was that what he was doing is he knew that every day he was scaring me to death. But he also knew that every day I stepped up to the challenge and I did what he asked and I was successful in overcoming that fear and making it happen. And I tell you, that was just the most powerful, powerful thing I could have ever received from that experience because I, my problem was I didn't think I was tough enough. I didn't think I was strong enough or, you know, brave enough to make these amazing things happen. But over a three month period of time, he was prove I was proving to myself through his guiding me that I could. And that was incredibly powerful. So I'm very grateful for the experience. Siri, one of the things that you just outlined for me was an important distinction that I want people to have, which is so often in life, people don't begin something because they just don't believe it's possible. Something inside of you wanted this. You had this hunger that in spite of your fears and your uncertainties pushed you through. But one of the things I try to tell people is a belief is a poor substitute for an experience. Right? You, you had your beliefs about what was possible and then you know you get a hold of the right coach and he gives you some experiences. Now, to your credit, <laughs> you know, most people would give up. You just continue to push yourself through. But you develop more and more, not just physical muscle and speed and strength, but the mental side has to have been a transformation. How would you describe the difference between you today as a human being, as an athlete, you know, as a coach, compared to what you were like before you went through that transformation with him? I just feel like such a different person on the inside because I, it, I'm happy to live in my own body. And I mean, the mental side of things is just, it's so critical. And for so long, I was just self-sabotaging, you know, in everything I was trying to do, I was self-sabotaging, not to the point where I wasn't trying and giving 100% effort, but where I would let myself fall into bad patterns of, you know, doubting myself or thinking too much about what everyone else was doing and, you know, not keeping all the focus on me. And I think now, I mean, just like what you were saying, I believe that if somebody wants something bad enough and they're willing to do all the work necessary to make that something happen, that anything is possible. And I believe that with all my heart, you know, because I'm living proof of that. So I'll never this, this doubt. This is the whole reason we wanted to interview because you are <laughs> such, because it's so rare. You know, most people who become athletes are such extraordinary athletes, at least early on, people see them as such. 
or they've been training in a sport for their entire life. They don't make it all the way through college and then decide you're going to shift sports to one where you don't even know how to swim. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> I mean, like, you are such a delight in this area. There's this quote by Michelangelo, and it's, I saw the angel in the marble, and I carved until I set it free. Yes. And as a coach now, I use that quote every time I'm thinking about taking on an athlete that wants to be coach. And right away, I put that quote in my head and I think, do I see the potential in this person? Even it's like looking at me when I first started the sport, the sport as like this disaster who had no skill whatsoever. But if I could just feel something or see something that, sh that would give me that vision that I believed in. And I think that we all have that ability to have a vision for ourselves in our future. And then it becomes about making the choice to make that happen, to do whatever it takes to make that happen. And that means facing your fears. It means, you know, breaking patterns that always, you know, lead you the wrong direction. It's a matter of, you know, changing the things in your life that need to be changed to set you up for success and to be okay with failing. Um, you know, everybody has this fear of failure, but the way I see it, you know, every time I failed miserably, I grew so much and it made me better able to achieve greater things in my future. So you almost need that failure. I'm not saying, you know, I, I want failure for my athletes, but I think we grow so much more through the failures than we do the successes. And so being okay with failing and, and understanding that that's, you know, two steps back, three steps forward um, is crucial. You know, I, you, what, you, what you're talking about is exactly the same for the business owner. That's, you know, their capacity to be able to face their fears, their capacity to step back up from all the disappointments, their capacity to, you know, compete in the marketplace and lose and still get back up. I mean, you and I both know that's everything. But I think so many people relate to athletics, but they don't relate it back to their own lives very often. They just look at you as this super extraordinary human being. But you're bringing up another question that I want the listeners who own businesses or are part of anything. One of the things we have to do is decide who we're going to spend time with. And in business, we got to decide who we're going to hire. And so, you know, what do you think that, that he saw in you there back in Australia that was making him willing to bring you on, even though, quote, by your description, you're a disaster? He must have saw something else. And what is that thing? You know, if you're looking for someone, you're going to decide you're going to commit to coach them. You're going to bring them into your company, so to speak. You know, how do you know they're the right person? What, what criteria? What are you searching for? Well, you, know, you say you feel that spark. Tell us what that looks like. What do you think he saw in you? Have you ever asked him? And what are you looking for to make your choices about who you're going to bring into, you know, your family, so to speak? Yeah. So I finally asked him, actually, after I retired, I said, Brett, why in the world would you take on someone like me? And he said, Siri, I was watching you do a race in Australia. You were in probably 42nd place and you're in the last 400 meters of the 10K run. And you were absolutely killing yourself trying to catch 41st place. Wow. He said, I saw that and I thought, I, I want to coach that girl because it's that That's hunger. That's, and, it's, yeah. you know, and, and I guess he, I guess he felt, you know, the fact that I was in 42nd, that I didn't just think, oh, my race is over. This stinks. I'm in 42nd place. But it was like, no, I can be better than 42nd. Yeah. I want to go for 41st. Yeah. And so it's that hunger and it's that, you know, that desire, I think, you know, I tell my athletes when they go out to do the biggest race, you know, of the year, like the Ironman World Championships in Kona, I say, all we want today is for you to go out there and try to be better than you were yesterday and to race your race and be the best that you can be in as many moments as possible. And if they do that, Success is inevitable because you're not thinking about, oh, my God, you know, I'm halfway on the bike and I'm in, you know, 20th place, my race is over. You're just in the moment. You're making the most out of every single moment. You're executing to the best of your ability. You're staying positive and enthusiastic. And you're just looking to have your best performance on that day. So as far as, you know, taking on athletes, I think some of the crucial characteristics are, are having that hunger, having that passion, um, having a really solid work ethic, um, having respect for their teammates. And, and actually, one of the most important things is having that appreciation for this amazing opportunity that they have to train at this level, to race at this level, 
the fact that we all that we have you know two arms and two legs and we're able to to swim bike and run having that appreciation for the everyday and and all the things they're able to do every day um because i think that's key it's 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 feeling like what we're doing is is actually it's a great privilege to be able to do this i know what what was my main motivator in races after I started training with Brett and something that changed, you know, how I went into races, I had been feeling so thankful for these incredible gifts. Um, and, and those gifts, not physical gifts, because I obviously didn't really have them in the beginning, but the desire I had and the willingness to, to suffer out there and the willingness to push myself to my limits and the opportunity to do so. And I felt so grateful to whatever God you believe in or whatever entity you believe in, I felt so grateful. And what I, I was so desperate to show my appreciation for that to, to, the, to the entity that I believe in, that I said to myself, the best way I can show my thanks is to go out there. And when the gun goes off, I give it everything I have, that I am recognizing my abilities and my talents and my gifts, and I'm going to use them to the fullest to celebrate them and show how much I appreciate the fact that they're mine. And that changed everything for me because it wasn't about, I have to make this team. I have to win this race. I have to make a paycheck. It was about, I just want to show my thanks for what I've been blessed with or what I've worked hard for and the fact that I'm able to do this. And I really actually, now that I'm able to be a little pickier in choosing who I want on my team, um, I want that kind of perspective. Um, and it doesn't make anybody weaker. It doesn't make anyone, you know, less tough or less relentless out there. It just is a much more positive environment to work in. Plus, I you, believe. You, know, you know what you do is you become proud of yourself as a human being so often you hear people talk about i have no self-esteem because of what people said to me when i was a child or something and i was like yeah. it's so convenient you remember those things and you forget the good things but here's the truth someone could tell you your whole life you're beautiful and you're magical and you're skillful and you can still not believe in yourself and you someone can tell you you're a total piece of you know what and you can say screw you i'm going to show you who you are we're not controlled by what people have told us the only way to have self-esteem which i hate the term but inner pride is to earn it and the way we earn it is by pushing ourselves beyond anything we think we're capable of which is why i wanted to interview why you're so beautiful you know coach coach uh, john wooden as you probably know is one of the greatest the greatest college basketball coach in history won 10 out of 12 ncaa national championships 88 games in a row and with different players not like the nba right every every year you're losing some of your players the college players and i interviewed him and i asked him one time i said you know i, have, I interviewed him about four times over my lifetime. Uh, and I was I did the last live interview with him, which was very touching. But the bottom line is I asked him, I said, which team is the one you're most proud of? And it was interesting. I thought he was going to tell me the team of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and the one that most people know is the most famous team. And he named a team I'd never heard of. And I said, why? And he said, because Jabbar and those guys were wonderful. They were champions. But he said, they did really well, but this team maximized their potential. He said, I always taught these young men from day one that there's only one way to know whether you won or lost, and it's not looking at the scoreboard. He said, because there are going to be days when the other team may get lucky. There may be days when you get some bad calls. That's just part of the game. So there's only one way to know. And he said, the way you're going to know is if every single moment in that court, you ask yourself, I gave every ounce of my soul for every minute I was on that court, then you've won. And he said, if you do that every single time, you don't focus on anything, but giving everything you have, he said, more often than not, you're going to have the highest score. He said, but most importantly, he said, you will know what victory is. If you got the highest score and you didn't give your all, you lose. He said, the way I taught these men is what we give, we keep forever. What we fail to give, we lose for a lifetime. And I think you've really wow. lived that. I'm, I'm inspired by you personally. I think you're just such a beautiful soul. I just have to say, and I'm sure everyone listening oh is inspired God. by you. you. You are the perfect example of we are the creators of our lives. We are not the managers of our circumstance. If we're willing to push through the pain, the suffering, the fears, the limits, and if we're willing to be in a position where we really have something that we really want to serve larger than ourselves, something we want to achieve, something we want to give. Phenomenal. Truly phenomenal. Truly phenomenal. And I oh got to say, God. just listening to you guys, I can't tell you how much, Siri, as you talk about how you recruit your athletes, how much it reminds me as someone who works for Tony. It's like talking to Tony, like all these little isms that you have. Just when you told the story about, you know, if you, you called it choking, but owning it. 
And it's like, that's everything. If we screw up around here, it, the first thing that Tone will tell us, any of his employees is take accountability, own it and grow from it. And even just, you know, Siri watching you telling all your athletes when they get in the pool to have a purpose for practice, not just recording junk miles. And it's like, we don't have a flash meeting. We don't have a conference call. We don't have anything without Tony saying, know your outcome. Like, what's the point if you don't have a purpose, if you don't have an outcome, if you don't have a point? And then lastly, of course, the human factor, just talking about people seeing you not just for as an athlete, but as a human being. And I think, you know, it's again, Tony, one of the things that you do so well with your employees and in, in recruitment is just these people are human beings at the end of the day and at the beginning of the day and all day long. We're still, <laughs> we're still human beings. We still put our converse on one shoe at a time. So just remembering it's, that human factor and it's just, it's remarkable, the similarities here. Sarah, you also just so touched by humility. I'm sure everyone listening is, but I just, it's, it's a rare thing, unfortunately. A lot of athletes, uh, as they get better, they lose that edge and I think it's probably what makes you such a great coach is that same caring that your first coach had for you as a person first, you clearly have for your athletes. And uh, I just, I can't compliment you enough. And that's really what's missing in so many companies. You know, Richard Branson has always said to me, he said, Tony, it's your employees first, right? Then you go to your customers and then it's your shareholders. And that's gotta be the order in business as well. And I think when people fall in love with their clients or customers, when they decide they want to do more for them than anybody else, when they become as committed to that, being number one only happens in business when you find a way to do more for others than anybody else is doing. When you add more value, the value that people really desire. And you're doing that as a coach today. Tell me, what gives you the most fulfillment today in your life? Well, this is incredibly fulfilling. And first of all, thank you for all the kind words. And seriously, Tony, I mean, so much of it is from your guidance with, with the books of yours that I have read. I mean, I, I can't stress enough just how much they changed my life and um i just i, I don't even know what to say You're, you guys are just being so nice but i'm incredibly grateful to be here talking to you um so now i've forgotten the question I <laughs> okay, just saying, what, I tell me to, what, what gives yeah. you the most juice what, what are you most passionate about what are you most fulfilled by at this stage of your life and you know how is it different than when you were competing because that's another challenge that's for question. you know just to give you an idea business owners one of the challenges they have is Often they become a business operator. They're so doing everything in the business that they don't, they lose sight of the vision. They lose sight of what they're doing and they never grow the business. You can, you know, you can go to give you a, a, a metaphor to a hamburger stand. You can come back 20 years later and the same guy's got one hamburger stand and then somebody else has grown a hundred of them, right? And maybe sold them. Yeah. They had a different vision, right? They didn't stop at some place. So I'm just curious. I know you've never stopped. I'm curious, what's different for you today? What fulfills you most today? What are you most passionate about today? And how is it different than when you were competing? In other words, instead of just running my business day to day, maybe I can elevate to a different level where I have more freedoms in my life, but I'm still really fulfilled. I'm still kicking butt. I'm just looking for that metaphor or that example in you in this area. Yeah, I think when I was racing, you know, I was still finding myself and, and I didn't really know who I was. And when I won my first world championship, I seriously, I could have retired right then and there because there was something that told me I found what I'm looking for. And that was my faith in myself and confidence and strength. But I kept going because I didn't want to be a fluke and I was just embracing the incredible opportunity. And when I first started coaching, I mean, there is still now I've gone into this new, this whole new area where I'm, I'm guiding these athletes. And, and when an athlete comes to me, it's like they have their dream and they're basically like putting it in my hands and saying, I trust you to help me achieve this dream. And when I know what my dream meant to me, it was like everything to me. So I think it's such an incredible privilege when an athlete trusts you with theirs. And so what continues to inspire me today, as it did 10 years ago or 11 years ago when I started coaching and as an athlete, was just wanting to be the best that I can be every single day, not just for me, but for these amazing athletes that have entrusted me with their dreams. And I feel, you know, I'm asking them to perform at higher and higher levels every year because the level of our sport keeps getting better and better. And if I'm asking that of them, then I need to up my game each year too. And so I get passionate about learning and passionate about, you know, studying different sports and reading and, you know, trying to find ways to strengthen myself and what I know and how I can do things. So, so that constantly inspires me. Siri, I got to say, 
you and Tony are like brothers from another mother. Everything that you're saying, I, I'm laughing over here. I have to interject because I'm like going to crack up. Tony, there's not one day that Tony doesn't like learn something or read something. And he's like, I got to share this with everyone. And you're like, <laughs> oh my God. I mean, to, to be seen as a possible like cousin of Tony's. Wow. Like that would be, that's the ultimate compliment right there. But, um, I think as an athlete, the, the big thing as an athlete was that I hadn't um, accepted who I was fully. Um, I came out as, as gay when basically after I retired uh, from the sport. And that was really hard to carry around this secret and to try and be something that I wasn't. And then, you know, I met my now wife, Rebecca Keat, and fell madly in love with her oh, and that's she's awesome. a friend of mine who's also just as wonderful as you i have to just say i'd be remiss if i didn't say what a doll rebecca yes. is she is you know we we had known each other for 15 years but obviously you know we were at times in our lives where we didn't even really look at each other in any way except wow i just love that girl she makes me happy she makes me laugh and you know can't wait to see her at the next race um but when she asked me to coach her in 2012 um, we started working together and um, it was actually, it was really scary for me because I'm someone who, you know, I have very strict boundaries with my athletes and, and I had always learned and thought, you know, never, ever cross that line with somebody. Love messes working. with anything you believed before. <laughs> Even your monk life. <laughs> oh, oh my God. I mean, and, but we just. Uh, I, we just started, somebody put us in the same house together. And I had always said, I will not live with an athlete. So no matter what, I'll live in a tent, but I cannot live with an athlete. Um, but one of my athletes at the time said, look, you're going to be upset with me, but you have the whole upstairs and you're sharing a house. And I'm really sorry, but it's with Rebecca Keat. You have totally your own space. So I was, you know, not that happy about it, but I didn't really <laughs> have a choice. And um just had long talks. I just got to know her really well. And I tell you, we just fell so madly in love. And when we realized that that's what was happening, um, we had to sit down and she said, you know, I'll retire. I won't do the sport anymore because I want to be with you. And I said, wow. well, you know, I, I, I wouldn't do that because I didn't want to let down these athletes that rely on me. And I said, well, I need to sit all of them down and talk with them about it and let them, you know, voice their concerns or ask me questions and we did that and everybody was so incredibly supportive because i i've had a lot of i don't want to say bad luck in love but i've made bad choices and i've been you've, really hurt you've learned <laughs> that's what it's called unfortunately that's how learning. we all learn <laughs> we don't call it the losing team around here we call it the learning team and, and that's my favorite thing you're either winning or learning so yes i i totally agree with you and um and i really had kind of almost come to the point where I'm like, I love my life. I love my job. I love my animals and I don't need to find anyone. But when you find a love, and this is a love that as a, even a four-year-old kid, I can remember thinking about, God, I just, like, I don't know if I actually consciously thought these exact words, but it was like, I wanted a love where I felt safe and I felt appreciated and somebody that made me happy. And, um, and I just never had that. And I almost thought that it wasn't possible. But as Beck and I started spending more time together and, and falling in love, I thought to myself, you know what? This is something that I thought was just a fairy tale. And it's presented itself in my life. And not only do I need to just be so thankful and, and go you know, full on and allow myself to love this person, but I want the world to know because this is something that, you know, I thought was a fairy tale and is actually happening in my life and I want people to know. And so when we got married, we, we sent out a, a tweet or a Facebook message and, you know, both of us were a little scared to, to lay this out there. But I tell you what, there was not one person that said anything negative and, and they were all so supportive. And I think that when the people around you that care about you and, and appreciate you and, and know, you know, that you're doing your best in life. They just want you to be happy. Exactly right. And love is love. Love is love. Yeah. And she's the greatest thing that has ever happened to me and has brought me <laughs> such a confidence inside because I, I, I don't know how to explain it, but the, but her love has made me stronger and that's made me a better coach 
and that's made me a better example for, for the athletes I do coach. And I'm so grateful for that. So another thing I'm just so excited about is being married, which I never thought I would be, and wow. being able to share dreams and goals with someone who is so motivated and so passionate about life. And, and we share all the same you know, dreams and loves. And so that's something I'm very grateful for. And I think it makes a point too, you know, I think sometimes people in business or, or people in sport, they think that it has to be all about work or all about the sport. And if they do anything else, you know, it's going to lessen their power in that area. I think I've found that the more I kind of take care of myself too, yes. um, the better coach I am for my athletes that the times when I have just been all just fully, it's all about them and my, I can wait, you know, I'm not going to take care of myself. They come first. I'm actually doing a better job now because I'm taking care of me and I show up at work, you know, excited and creative and clear in my head. And um, I just feel it, it makes you better at whatever it is you're doing in your life. If you really are taking care of yourself too, um, it leads to a confidence and a, just an inner power that really does get noticed with the people that you're working with. Okay, you couldn't put, you couldn't have a better life story. <laughs> first, first you figure out that you're the worst in, in the world at something you at least think. You then figure the journey and how to become the best. You then follow other people to become the best at what they do. And in the end, you get the love of your life. Get the girl. The, uh, get the I got girl. to save. I wasn't crying my eyes out over here. Siri, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> but not only do you get the girl more importantly you get the understanding that that feeling of love that feeling of joy that feeling of being fully alive is a gift inside you to give to others and you can't give to others what you don't already have inside and you've you've been able to give other people the things in the sport side and you've been such a love it's so obvious just your who you are as a person and i'm sure that's a giant part of why you're able to coach people so effectively because they feel so cared for by you that they'll find a better place a deeper place inside themselves because they feel you found it inside of them but to have you have that also to me nothing on earth is more important than love and i'm so grateful that our society has finally grown up a bit where they understand love is love in whatever form and understand that that's not something the mind has a choice over that's something that comes from inside the heart and soul of a human being so good on you and good for you and i'm so thrilled that you've got the love that you deserve and i can only imagine how much of that love you then pour into your athletes and how they pour that into their sport and to themselves and into their families I mean, it's a virtuous circle. You're extraordinary. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Tony. I mean, that's my ultimate goal is I just want to be the, the best that I can be to bring out the best in others. And I, I just don't even know what to say <laughs> to your words. You're just so amazing and so kind and i'm just so grateful so thank you i mean th this is probably the highlight of my life to this point right now so just <laughs> being so able sweet. to don't talk to back. you <laughs> <laughs> she knows i've already told her <laughs> no secrets no secrets well i'm grateful to mary and, and uh, i guess her girlfriends that uh, put us all here together that know this circle but i'm really grateful i want to ask you one more question final question uh, knowing who our audience is if i said even though it's not necessarily your normal focus I want you to help somebody. They just started a business. They, you know, to do that, you got to believe in yourself a certain extent. But just like anything, once you begin the endeavor, you know, your, your confidence and your ideas and your visions get tested as they have been for you. What would be the best advice you give someone who's just beginning the journey and they've entered a business and maybe it's not completely where they wanted to be. Maybe they're feeling exhausted right now. Maybe they're feeling overwhelmed. Maybe they're feeling frustrated. Maybe they're feeling past the threshold of what they can control. <laughs> And part of them wants to give up and part of them knows they can't. You know, you've been there. What would you say to anybody who might be in that place to get themselves to the next level? I would say, number one, be brave. Uh, number two, which is so important, be relentless. In, be, be, brave in meaning, be brave meaning do what you're afraid of? Or give us your definition be, of being brave. Yeah, so be brave. You know, do, even though you feel afraid or you feel uncertain, that uncertainty is a great catalyst to making things happen. So get comfortable with the uncertainty and be brave knowing that if you're going to put in everything you have towards making this work, it will happen. But you need to be resilient. And you need to be relentless. You know, resilience means being able to accept when you get knocked down and yep. pick yourself back up again right away and still have faith and keep believing that what you're doing is going to pay off. Because 
one thing I've found in my life, it's been the, the biggest struggles and the hardest things that I've had to do that have led to the most incredible, if you want to call it, victories. And I've never actually had a great victory where everything went perfectly. So <laughs> Me either. It's such a important <laughs> point. That's so true. Never. And so, Never. you know, be resilient, get knocked down, but you get right back up again and be relentless in your pursuit of making this happen because it will happen. And I believe that the universe, you know, on purpose kind of makes it harder for you to find out if you really have what it takes to follow through with what you want to be doing. So, you know, be brave, which also means believe in yourself, believe in your vision, um, be relentless, be resilient. And, Embrace the process. Like, I mean, there's no greater gift, I think, than for me being able to look back at where I started. We were just talking about the other day, Tony, about how people, a secret to look at how far you've come, that gap of how far you've come instead yeah. of the gap that I think people That's a good often thing. look at. That's a good thing for our listeners maybe to catch on to. Mary and I were talking, you we know, bouncing ideas back and forth, how to get it across to people that a lot of people in life spend their life in so much stress and they don't feel fulfilled because the gap they focus on is the gap between where they are and where they want to be. And that's useful to look at, right? Because it can motivate us, it can drive us. But if you only live there, you don't have the same level of strength and inner resiliency because you can't build on failure. In the beginning, you're not good at things, right? You know, if you're honest with yourself, exactly. you, none of us were good in the beginning. And then what happens is gradually you can swap to a different gap and you can gap back. And what I tend to do is make sure that I look back and go, can you believe this is where we are now? And I got backwards to where I started. And I go, you know, I, my first speech, you know, this is the biggest disaster in the world. My first time starting is trying to start a little company. My first time trying to do this, trying to figure out how, you know, I could make, you know, a thousand dollars being able to do something. And I just got a million dollars to speak for three hours. It's like, you know, there's a bit of a gap there. <laughs> But if I got it's forward, amazing. if I got forward only, then I'm always feeling like I'm not who where I should be. And that puts people where they're achieving, but they're not fulfilled. And I think what I, really what I have left this conversation with with you, Siri, is besides even more respect for you and even more love for you, is that you have figured out achievement and fulfillment. And I think that's the piece that business owners, athletes, average human beings have forgotten our society promotes to achieve to achieve to achieve to achieve and we push so hard to achieve and a lot of people get there and then they go is this all there is i can't tell you how many academy award nominees how many billionaire businessmen and they call me in to quote help them with some aspect of their business and what i discover is i'm a trojan horse i'm going to give them what they want for their business but what they need is to be fulfilled they need to feel joy in life they need to feel a sense of ecstasy and gratitude and a sense that their life has purpose and meaning and what you've managed to do is not only achieve, but you've managed to also find that deep level of love and fulfillment and purpose. And what I love about you is that you're helping your athletes, just like John Wooden would, did, to become better human beings. I mean, there is no greater gift any of us can do is to be a better human being and then through our pain and our lessons to hopefully make it easier for others, show them a pathway that shortens the amount of time. Maybe we can help them compress decades into days or weeks or months as our years as opposed to decades and you're such a model of that so i hope everyone listening here has been as touched by you as i've been you're like my john wooden siri you're like for all of our nieces and daughters and all the the girls and women out there former college athletes also it's just so beautiful to hear people always talk about you know you gra you play your heart out you play the best four years of your life and then you graduate and that's it like what are you gonna do go play slow pitch somewhere in a league like that's yeah, and just to see what you've done with your life and the fulfillment that you found and how you found it, it's just such a lesson that I really do hope young, especially young girls and, and hear and take away from you and it's so important. What I'm just so touched by and what you and Tony have alluded to are just how you both kind of don't believe in failure. When I'm here, whenever I hear people ask Tony, you know, what's your what do you consider your greatest failure? He says, again, from a place of humility, it's not that I don't have any failures, it's that I don't see them as failures because it's just a, an, an opportunity to grow. And I hear you um, and your language is just so similar to that. I know, so you come out of Brown, ice hockey, field hockey, and lacrosse. It sounds like your lacrosse was your love. You try out for Team USA lacrosse and don't make the final cut, which as an athlete, like just reading, like that, not making a cut, especially as athletes is just, I can't even read the words without getting that pit in my stomach. Like, oh, the don't make the cut pit in your gut. It's just like, oh, you know, we've all been there. And it's yeah. just heartbreaking. So first, how do you rebound from that? Just like a business owner having to rebound from 2008, how do you rebound from that? 
Um, yeah, that was that was devastating because it really was this great love of mine. I, I loved the sport of lacrosse and and I was passionate about it. And I my dream at that point in time was to make the USA team. But I I didn't make the cut. And I think the biggest disappointment of all, and, and I think this is just the kind of person that I was at the time, is I was more disappointed in myself that I didn't keep just playing on my club team and working on my skills and getting better and trying harder and go back again and try and make it the following year. And But then I give myself a little credit and I say, maybe that just wasn't my destiny because obviously, you know, when I started triathlon, it was so clear that I had such a long way to go, um, but I still kept fighting for that. You know, was that the fact that I didn't try and, and I was disappointed in myself for not trying again in lacrosse or was it that I was now ready because this is the path that I was really meant to have this journey on? Um, so yeah, it was devastating, but I think the fact that I knew, you know, there's nothing worse than starting something and not finishing, you know, like you have a race and you quit. And those are, I think, the hardest things to rebound from because you let yourself down. Um, but that's also a huge motivator. So when that does happen to you, and it happens to all of us, all of us quit in something at some point or fail along the way. And like you said, Mary and Tony, I know you believe this, you know, we learn so much from those so-called failures that they really shouldn't be called failures. Um, so yeah, I think that really motivated me to do it different the next time. And when I found out this love for triathlon, there was nothing that was going to stop me. No embarrassment, no terrible race. Um, nobody saying, you know, oh, you don't look like you could be a triathlete. Nothing was going to stop me. I was going to stay the course and be relentless and be resilient and make it happen. Um, so again, I, you know, I think that that may, not making the team was one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. You're a better woman than I, Siri, because I, I actually, I tried out for the USA baseball team, made a bunch of cuts, didn't make the final cut. And my way out was at the time I was writing a story for ESPN about it. So I kind of rationalized like, after crying my eyes out of like, oh, I didn't make the final cut. <laughs> then I was like, fine, I'm just going to be a journalist, which led me to you, Tony. So, I'm so, so there. grateful. Yeah. I'm grateful for that path. <laughs> you find the right path. You find the path that you're meant to be on Absolutely. one way or another. Oh my God. And you're doing amazing things now. So that was like meant to be. And, and look at the amazing stuff you're doing now. So yeah, you, you put me to shame in a lot of ways. Trust me. I just wanted to ask you about your Polo Sport Ralph Lauren sponsorship that came, you know, as we look at kind of the arc of your life from the standout college athlete, and then you move to Worcester, Mass, which I have been to, and I'll tell you what, it's not the most scenic place in Massachusetts, the state <laughs> that I love, but you move to Worcester, Mass to work at the YMCA, and then down, down the road, you're getting this sponsorship opportunity from Ralph Lauren, so you just, again, like the arc of that, the heroic kind of build up to where you are. But still, even that had its challenges, and maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Absolutely. Well, I had moved to Worcester. I actually had been coaching field hockey and lacrosse for a year at Princeton University and then a year at Lehigh University. And my move to Worcester was actually because I had a lot of friends that were gay that lived in Worcester. And it was the only place where I felt kind of safe and felt like I had a little bit of a community of people that I could be me and just like talk freely about who I was. Um, so I got this actually amazing job at the YMCA. And with that came a lot of really down to earth, amazing people that supported me and supported my dream of, of doing triathlon. Um, so that all was just a brilliant gift. Um, when I, I hadn't quite made it yet, I, I had turned professional in 1996. Um, I didn't feel I was ready to turn pro, but one of my greatest heroes in the sport, Karen Smyers, who's a multiple world champion, said, Siri, you're ready. Just don't be afraid. Do it. So I turned pro, and one of my college lacrosse teammates actually was working at Ralph Lauren and was running the RLX um, 
part of that company, which was uh, the Polo Sport. And they were putting together like a, a mountain bike team and a triathlon team. Actually, her idea was a triathlon team because she knew I was doing triathlon. And she said, Siri, I'm going to really try and put this together and make this happen. It ended up being this unbelievable deal. You know, our sport has very little money in it. You know, you can't really make a rich living in this sport. And that's, you know, the people that are doing it are doing it because they find it so incredibly challenging and, and they love it so much that it doesn't really matter what they can make from it. Um, it's more about what the sport does for them on the inside. And so my friend got me on this team and because I wasn't very good at the time, and, and there was another athlete, Tim DeBoom, who also was kind of at the same stage I was as far as, you know, decent, we had potential, but we'd not really done anything significant yet. Um, so they put together this contract that was just unheard of in our sport. I mean, incredible bonuses. If you win a world championship, they're going to, you know, equal the prize money. And, and at that time it was like $20,000 to win a world championship. So suddenly now, if you win a world championship, you're making $40,000. Um, and if you want to, <laughs> yeah, no, but that was huge, yes. you know, just huge. massive. And, um, and if you win a race, they would, you know, equal the prize money. And most races were $6,000 to win it at the time. So, I just looked at this and they were giving you shoes and a bike and running shoes and swim gear, everything you could possibly need. Um, what was, was the, all what was the catch? Oh, well, right. So it was all under this RLX umbrella and I was so excited and felt so incredibly like, wow, I'm so lucky. I went for my interview um, in New York city and I was so excited to see my friend that went great, but I sat down with um, the person that was in charge of the team and he didn't outright uh, say what the point of this story is, but he said to me, he said, okay, two things, very important. You need to grow your hair long and you need to get a boyfriend. He said, everyone on this team is either married or has a boyfriend. Um, and we just need to, you know, maintain that, that family image. And Oh boy. Right at the time, obviously, you know, I'd been living in Worcester and I was finally really kind of building confidence enough. I turned pro, building confidence enough to, to walk out of that closet for the first time. To be but I left to be me, which was really just was starting to feel so good. But I tell you what, I walked out of that meeting and I went, walked straight back into the closet and slammed the door shut behind oh me. And I for how threw long? my hair. Oh, I mean, the rest of my career, basically. And, wow. and I went so far back into the closet that by the time I retired from the sport, I actually got engaged to a man um, the year after I retired. And because I was still in that it, it kind of brainwashed into thinking this is who I need to be. Um, ultimately, what happened with RLX is, you know, they didn't expect either me or or Tim to do as well as we did. And we both won a world championship that year and we won a lot of races and this was totally unexpected, but that's what happens when you actually get support, you know, that, that yeah. really can help you move forward. Um, and they, after that year, the following year, they said, Oh, there's a clause in the contract where we can, you know, get out of this agreement whenever we want. And they actually sent that to, to me and November. So that kind of meant that going into the year where I was the, current world champion I had no sponsors so wow. that was that was hard as well um but the the lasting effect of that comment you know you're thinking this is where I can make a great living these people are willing to support me but they're only willing to support me if I fit into that image um that they're looking for and so that made me feel less than like I can't be gay that's going to prevent me from leading the life that I so desperately want to lead you know being successful and and being respected and um so it really did it was really hard on me and it took until a few years after I retired to say you know what I just can't do this anymore I'm not in the sport anymore and maybe I'm taking the chance that I've seen all the success I'll ever have in my life because I'm going to be who I want to be but I'll take it that's the ultimate success though isn't it being who you really are no matter what anybody else thinks or experiences I mean what what would be your advice? I mean, this, this just kills me to see human beings who, you know, have to hide who they are 
And then, unfortunately, more and more in the United States and other parts of the world, we're seeing a change. There's plenty of parts of the world where, you know, you can put to death for something of this nature. It's just, you know, human beings being human yeah. beings. It's insane. But what would your advice be here today to someone who is struggling with, you know, coming out? Um, would you do it the same way again, you know, after 10 years of, you know, going backwards? And would you go through that? Would you step up? How, what would advice would you give? And I can't wait to hear um, it, Siri, because I, I have to say I sat in Tony's Unleash the Power Within seminar in 2006. That was my introduction. And there's a process that where you write down your limiting beliefs, the Dickens process. And Tony kind of tells a story of his previous limiting beliefs of, you know, everyone, the, the generalized limiting beliefs of humanity. Either I'm too young or I'm too old or I don't have enough money or I don't have the resources or... And for me, I was sitting in there and you, and you write it down in your notebook and then you share with the person next to you. And I remember thinking like my biggest limiting belief or one of them is like, I'm gay. Like I, I can't, I can't be like this to either my family or my future employers or like I, and then I was like, I can't even write this in my notebook because after I write it down, I'm going to have to share with the guy next to me. And I don't even know if I am really ready to like have this be a conversation. And I don't, I think it's just like when you have that struggle of like, I'm just, I don't even know who I am. Like, it feels like it, it doesn't feel so esoteric to say, I don't know who I am when you're like, I, when you're so strong willed and I am too, that there's a part of yes, me that's like, are, screw baby. it. I can just, <laughs> I'll just marry whoever they want me to. Like, it's not even, not yeah. even in a lay down or like a, you know, a concession, but it's just like, well, if that's, it's the achievement. It's like, if this is what's going to help me achieve this, then sometimes I think we just kind of go blind and it's like, yeah, just you, you force it one way or, or whatever. I don't know, Siri, what would you say? Yeah, well, you're so right. And in a sense, we're rejecting ourselves in that moment and pretending to be something that we're not. But I would totally do it uh, differently <laughs> now. But I think that it was so important that I did go through that because, um, you know, I, I think it's my duty now that I am where I am, to share that with people that are willing to listen. And I think that that my story can hopefully help other people feel a lot more confident in being who they are. Because one thing I found, and, and you can even see it in like amazing people, um, Ellen DeGeneres is someone that I just look up to. And, and yeah, once we she love came her. out. Yeah, we love Ellen. She's a, she's a oh, dear friend. Uh, no, stop it. Oh, my God. Well, she's <laughs> just like my most favorite celebrity in the world but to see her you know she went through that she came out she lost her tv show you know went through kind of i i imagine a a tough time but look at her now you know and i feel that when we accept ourselves for who we are and when we decide you know what i'm going to celebrate who i am and be who i am and not let anyone tell me that they don't agree with it i feel like at that point when you're willing to Give yourself that kind of credit and 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 have the courage to be you that you can achieve so much more. And so in my being able to share this story, I feel like I kind of like, yeah, I, I achieved some some great things, thank God, in, in the sport and, and I worked hard for those. But I feel like your possibilities in your life and what you're capable of achieving become so much greater when you are free and you can be you and you can be authentic and you can, you know, really give all of yourself to the people you choose to have around you and the people that you are, you know, sharing life with. So I think having, so maybe I wouldn't change the way I went through it, but Mm. there needs, but I like being able to, I'm, I'm writing, actually my book is coming out in September. And one of the things I really wanted to put in that is that, how we were in our past doesn't have to be our story forever. Like, you know, you may be in a place that you're not proud of. I wasn't proud of the fact that I was completely in the closet and literally brainwashed myself to actually get engaged to be married to a man when I knew I was gay. But, you know, I finally found the courage in due time to be me. And I changed what my life looked like. I didn't have to live that life. I didn't have to be scared. I didn't have to be shy. I didn't have to lie and say, yeah, I love me, you know, whatever. Um, by being me, I felt like I suddenly had way more ability to achieve the things I really dreamed doesn't it, of. Doesn't, than it, I, doesn't it really free up energy inside you that now can be redeployed? The energy that's constantly monitoring to try and make yourself safe or make yourself be in the right place. My experience is, 
doesn't it unleash that energy for other things? Um, it completely unleashed the power within me. <laughs> like, <laughs> seriously, honestly, it takes, and for me, I'm, I'm generally a, a pretty anxious person, or at least I, I really used to be. And yeah, having to hide and having to think about what you're saying to this person and how you talk to that person, it's exhausting. And when you finally free yourself of those chains, it's like, wow, I just feel like completely revived and rejuvenated and like I can achieve so much more. Well, and you, I, you just have to stop caring about the critics and say, you know what, like, it doesn't matter. I want to be me. I want to be happy. I want to be healthy. I want to be able to be everything that I dream of being. And you can't do that if you're hiding from yourself. Yeah, it's so true. So many times people say to me, you know, I just don't know how to love myself. I know I need to, but I can't. And I always tell people it's hard to love yourself when you're not being yourself. And I think most of us have adapted. It isn't, it isn't just someone who's living in a culture that doesn't accept you for something like your sexual preferences. People from every walk of life have. To me, that's one of the most extremes and unjust. But people have it based on color of skin. People have it based on whether they have money or not. People, there are so many things that human beings do. And our brains are trying to do that impossible task, which is make everybody like us, everybody agree with us, <laughs> yeah. everybody support us, everybody love us. And it's just an impossible task. The only thing that matters is the people that you love, the people that, you know, that are closest to you. They know who you are, as you said. And those are the ones that matter. But we have to pull that together. And sometimes there aren't many of those. Sometimes it's you and God, yeah. you know, until you start <laughs> yeah. to find the right friend. But they're out there. And, I, and I'm hoping that talking about this might stimulate some people to think about what part of my life am I hiding from myself? What real desire or hunger or, you know, where am I conflicted? And, you know, conflict is not a bad thing. You know, the difference between the water and the wind is how you get waves. It's a beautiful thing. And that's what makes <laughs> life feel alive. But, but if you don't confront it, if you don't uncover what it is that you're afraid of or what it is you think you have to be and find the truth that you're enough as you are, that doesn't mean you stay where you are. You might want to improve, grow, expand, transform, help others. But we all have, if we can't have that fundamental sense of appreciation of ourselves, it's really hard to truly consistently appreciate others. And so it affects every relationship we have, but most importantly, affects our experience of life. So I hope those listening, you know, uh, if, if someone's in that dynamic of in the closet, I hope that this will just, you'll be one more example like Ellen of somebody who was at the top of her game, was fearful. And in Ellen's case, she actually took the hit. She didn't want to, but she took the hit. But look where she is today, stronger than she's ever been. And she's free inside of herself as much as she is in the outside world. And that's why she's such, I, I see her such an incredible soul role model. Uh, Mary calls her lesbian Jesus, she says. Oh, <laughs> yes. Amen to that. I will I'm taking that. Because she took all the pain for everybody and then made it cool to be a lesbian, or, you know. It's, it's pretty amazing. Yes, absolutely. Tony had a meeting with Ellen and Portia. And uh, I had, of course, in our preparation, like we always do hours and hours, just like for this podcast, we're doing our preparation. I was like, you know, Tony, she's like lesbian Jesus. Like this is, this is all, this is all we've got. And so unbeknownst to me, let Ellen know that that's what I call her. And so when I did have the, my moment, my five seconds with Ellen DeGeneres, she said, bless you, my child. I hear I'm lesbian Jesus. <laughs> it was Mary's birthday. She got a picture on her birthday that's with lesbian true. Jesus. She was very happy. Oh, my God. That's the best birthday present ever. Wow. I love it. So thank you for the gift of your example and the gift of all you pushed yourself through and all the hard work and all the pain and all the joy that, uh, that you've brought to so many people watching your victories and watching it grow. And uh, I'm really glad that we have a ticket to your life where we got a little insight today. Uh, it's really touched us and inspired us. Oh, well, thank you so much. It was such an honor. And thank you for your continual inspiration and leadership. I mean, you've changed a lot of lives and, and I'm one of those lives. So I, I really am thankful, Tony and Mary. It's so awesome to meet you. And I really hope that I can hopefully inspire some people out there that would really make me happy. Well, you just spent uh, 45 minutes or an hour, or whatever we've cut this down to, with an extraordinary soul. And I hope it inspired you as much as it did to Mary and myself. I mean, anyone who listens to this woman is reminded of the truth. And that is, we are not managers of the circumstances of our life, that we have the ability to be creators, that we can create our life on our terms if we get a clear enough vision, if we can inspire ourselves enough, if we can overcome the fears and limitations within this mind and push through the pain 
then anyone on earth who wants it can have an extraordinary business, an extraordinary life, an extraordinary family, an extraordinary level of inner pride that comes when you master yourself and you don't settle. That's my takeaway from it. I'm very inspired by it. I hope you are too with your business, with your life, with your family. Mayor, what, what would you take from it? Well done. First of all, since we're on the road so much, I'm not going to cop out anymore when I don't pack my sneakers at the hotel room and I can't even make it down to the little hotel room gym to like lift five pounds. This chick on her inner converse in Switzerland biking for 42 kilometers. I don't even know how long that is. Yes. So that struck me, of course. And then this idea of like, just get comfortable with being yourself. Yes. Being who you are, not who anybody thinks you should be, tells you to be, has conditioned you to be. Feel it, grow into it explore it, settle into it. The freedom to be yourself is maybe the greatest freedom of all and it's one that you can only give yourself. And that's easy to say when the outside world is not supporting it. But one of the great gifts in life was my original teacher Jim Rohn said to me at one point when it felt like nothing was working and no one was responding to me and I had all these reasons why it wasn't coming together. And, and he just looked at me and he said, Tony, if you will continue to love, if you will continue to grow, if you will continue to give, your gifts will make room for you. And we all have gifts. And it's beautiful to see this woman's gifts. And I hope her gifts have inspired you to reclaim more of them today, every day, and, uh, and to create the life that you deserve. God bless. We'll look forward to seeing you at the next episode of the podcast. Till then, live strong and live with passion. Are you ready to create real lasting change in your life? Whether you're looking to make a massive breakthrough in your business, your relationship, your career, your health, or anything else in your personal life, Unleash the Power Within can help you unlock and unleash the forces inside of you and let you create the quality of life you desire and deserve. Learn more about UPW and how you can surpass your own limitations to achieve every goal you've ever wanted by visiting www.tonyrobbins.com unleashed. Carrie Song is our executive producer. Strategy and Distribution by Anna York and Tyler Culbertson. Jamie Carvajal and Adriel De La Torre are our digital editors. Copyright Robbins Research International.